Hello, and welcome to today's Forex webinar. Thank you for participating in our discussion titled The Rise of Ransomware and Cyber Extortion Tactics. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them through the private Q&A widget without disturbance to the program. If you're having technical issues, you can find answers to the common technical troubles located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen, or you can submit a question via the Q&A widget. An on-demand version of the webinar will be available approximately one hour after the program has concluded and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Finally, if you'd like Ohio CLE credit for this program, please fill out the survey and continuing education information form on your screen. There's also a certificate of attendance you can download following the program. And now for opening remarks and introductions, I'd like to turn the call over to John Nadolfi, partner at Bory Seder Seymour & Peace. Thank you, Mallory. Uh, my name is John Landolfi. I'm a partner at the Rory's Law Firm based in Columbus, Ohio, and I head up our uh, privacy and data security team. Uh, along with me today is my partner, Chris Ingram, who is the lead on our incident response, and we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, ransomware. Uh, but just a reminder first, uh, the materials we're going to discuss today are not intended as legal advice, um, but are really more for your consideration. I wanted to cover three topics with you today. We want to start with what is ransomware, uh, and then we're going to talk some about the legal considerations and implications of what might happen um, in preparation for a ransomware attack and or responding to a ransomware attack. And then we're going to give you some action items that we hopefully uh, that you'll hopefully uh, take away from today and, and maybe consider taking, putting into place uh, at your own organization. So, so what is ransomware? Um, understanding the risks of ransomware and cyber extortion now, post your visit is, is an important business function we think today. With technology becoming more intelligent and widespread, cybersecurity and privacy issues continue to be at the top of everyone's mind. And ransomware may be the primary focus of that. We've all seen the headlines and heard the news. Uh, ransomware seems to be everywhere nowadays and is, is, is affecting all industries. We read about Colonial Pipeline, we read about schools and universities, we read about hospitals. Uh, we've, we've heard the President speak about ransomware. In fact, we, we saw that the U.S. sanctioned a crypto exchange recently that's been accused of catering to, ran to ransomware criminals. Chris, you mentioned to me that you saw an article this morning on a similar topic. What, what was that about? Yeah, so yeah, just yesterday, the White House's National Security Council hosted a 30-nation summit specifically on uh, ransomware and strategies the international community can combat ransomware. So they, they, they handled topics such as, uh, you know, cryptocurrency or the, the method by which these ransoms uh, are typically paid as well as uh, norms for law enforcement investigation and cooperation among the countries. You know, I think one thing that stands out and would, does not come to, to much of a surprise for those of us in cybersecurity, Russia was not invited. Um, and and the, the theory is that you know, our, our companies here in the United States and, and um, globally are really being subject to attacks not just from a gang of thieves, but from nation state actors or actors who are being uh, or who are, who are acting at the behest of foreign governments um, and presumably including Russia. And you know another thing about the ransomware attacks that we're seeing uh, today, you know we've given talks to this, this group or CLE presentations to this group, uh, for several years now, and I can recall uh, six, seven years ago, we gave a, a, a presentation to to you all uh, about cybersecurity and, and incident response. You know, back then, it was the name of the game was really about credit card skimming, data breaches, you know, reselling social security numbers, those kinds of things. What well, turns out, the ransomware model is significantly uh, more lucrative to to bad actors. Uh, because there's different ways they can monetize and, and 
really appreciate the financial incentives uh, much quicker than they ever could stealing credit card numbers. So I think that's part of the explanation as to why you're seeing such pervasive uh, activity, at least one of the reasons. And of course, a reason that the federal government and our own president is so uh, interested in this is because the government was in fact impacted by ransomware. So indeed, ransomware is uh, pervasive, as Chris indicated. And, and, and frankly, in today's uh, threat landscape, it's even more likely, right? Given, given that we're all working from home and there's greater reliance on technology, uh, clearly the risks and the vulnerabilities for these types of attacks have only increased. And so uh, it is, th these risks are real, folks, and we, and we, we really uh, want to emphasize that, you know, this, this, is, this is crippling. This, this, a ransomware attack could literally shut down your business. Um, a ransomware attack could affect any and all of your electronic systems. Uh, you know, Chris and I have both worked with, with clients who who's, have been literally shut down for weeks as a result of a ransomware attack. You, for example, you, you may not be able to uh, communicate with any organization because your email systems may be on a server that was impacted. Uh, you may not have uh, access to your, to your billing function. You may not be able to be able to send bills out to your customers or clients. You, you may not be able to pay your employees because your payroll system uh, may have been impacted. So again, a, a, a real crippling effect to your to your to your business. Um, and then, of course, you face the difficult decision to pay the ransom. Um, as was alluded to earlier, um, the, the advice from the government and from law enforcement is to not pay ransoms, and that's in part because, of course, they believe it further incents the bad guys. But really, what are you going to do? From a practical perspective, if you are in a situation where you are completely shut down with no operations, your, your, your business simply cannot function, um, and your only option, you, you don't have backups, and, and you've determined through forensic review and other uh, means that your only option is to pay the ransom, what are you going to do? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more today about you know, that decision and, and uh, the legality or illegality of some of the components of that decision. But it really is sort of a, uh, a, a, a scary concept. Um, and then, of course, you, know, you, you, have, you have this idea of getting back up and running, depending upon you know, your backups, how quickly you can do this. Because recovery is, in fact, time consuming and can be very, very expensive. And even if you pay the ransom, it, 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 you, you still may face uh, remediating the vulnerabilities uh, and, and other costs associated with getting your systems back up and running. You're going to have to likely pay an outside forensic, forensic expert to come in and assist you with that. So this is really uh, a, a, a difficult time in, in a situation where your business isn't running. And then depending on the circumstances, depending on you know, if you have to give notice or, or if you know, third parties become aware of this, there's the chance that your, your, your business may suffer some sort of brand uh, reputational damage. So things to think about in the event of uh, a ransomware attack and why, good reasons why you should, I think, consider um, being prepared for one. So we're going to talk a little bit about what a ransomware attack is. And let's start with the sort of the, the obvious, which is what is a ransomware attack? Well, a, ransom, a ransomware attack is where cyber criminals lock you out of your systems. They, they literally lock you out of your systems. You can't get in and operate any of your, your electronic systems. I shouldn't say any, depending on the nature of the attack. You know, it may be all, it may be some, but you, you have the inability to access and use those systems, and, and, and they, the fact that encrypt those systems in a way where you can only access them if they give you the decryption code. And of course, they will only give you the decryption code if you pay for it. Um, and so, again, we, we talked earlier about that concept of whether or not you should pay. Um, the other thing to think about in a ransomware attack is uh, the bad guys now have taken to even stealing your information. They, they, they not only lock down your systems, but they have taken to stealing that information and uh, threatening to publish it, or in fact even publishing it before you pay the ransom, which means that some of the personal information, sensitive information that you possess may be exposed on the dark web. So again, that's what a ransomware attack is. How does it happen? Well, it can happen in a number of ways, typically the result of the bad guys exploiting vulnerabilities in your systems, right? Uh, how do they do that? Well, 
They can do it through fishing, spoofing, and whaling. You've all probably heard of phishing. You know, phishing is some sort of communication, either email or telephone or text, whereby the bad guys pass themselves off as some legitimate and trusted individual in an effort to lure the recipient of the email or the phone call or the text into giving sensitive personal data. Um, a whaling attack is when that phishing is directed towards a high-level executive of an organization or someone in the C-suite. That is typically done to get very high-level sensitive um, information about the business. Uh, spoofing is sort of the, the kind of global category that, that, is, that encompasses both phishing and whaling and other types of spoofing where, again, it, it's just a matter of uh, the bad guys um, masquerading as someone other than who they really are in an effort to get you to do something that you wouldn't otherwise do, like give them uh, your credentials, give them other types of information, sensitive information, things of that nature. Uh, another way that the bad guys get into your systems is through um, unfixed bugs, with you know a lack of patching um, or a lack of support from your from your uh, software provider. And those when you purchase software from a third party, it, it typically comes with a, some level of support over some period of time, and that includes the software su uh, supplier providing you with patches and fixes for vulnerabilities that they find. Uh, that that you know if you are getting those. Those updates from your, your uh, supplier, you should, uh, of course, apply those patches. Um, at some point, if your support runs out, you might want to think about updating your, your software and or um, finding new ways to identify those patches because if there are vulnerabilities uh, or bugs in your, your software system, again, the bad guys are, are pretty smart and they find ways to, to exploit those. Um, unmitigated access to information uh, is another way for anybody to get into your systems, right? I mean, we, we t and by the way, we're talking not just about uh, your electronic systems. We're talking about your, your paper records and files as well. So do you have, for example, safeguards in place? Do you have lock and key? Do you have those kinds of things to protect uh, information within your building or in, in within your electronic system? Or does anybody in the organization have access to that? Because if so, then the bad guys are going to find a way to get in. And then last, lastly, another means of, of, of a ransomware attack is what is now being called ransomware as a service. And let me tell you, folks, this is, this is kind of scary to me. Um, this is where <laughs> the bad guys who have no technical skills whatsoever actually subscribe to a service that's been created by another party who does have the skills to create a malware that can affect your system through make ransomware or otherwise. And, and, they, and they purchase it, or they do it for a commission. Um, so this ransomware as a service is available to anybody who does or does not have technical skills and can be applied uh, for the small uh, fee or percentage of the ransom that they would pay back into the creator of the ransomware. So again, this is available to anybody who might be enterprising enough to engage in this, a ransomware attack of this kind. Um, yeah, and, and, and to just pick up on that, you know, we're not we're not trying to scare everyone on this call, but you know the, these are the facts and the unfortunate reality of, of an information-based economy. Um, you know, put a star by the way if you're taking notes on the phishing uh, and lack of patching. You know, we'll talk about strategies uh, to combat ransomware here at the tail end of the presentation. But you know, gone are the days are emails from you know your distant cousin from Sierra Leone that wants you to wire money. Uh, today's phishing attacks are very sophisticated. So, for example, you know we took a screenshot of a phishing email that looks is made to look like a legitimate email from Microsoft, where you would click the click here link to you know, supposedly enable encryption on your device to do a good thing. And, and so, you know, uh, and unsurprisingly, in large organizations, uh, it's just a numbers game. Somebody's going to click on it at some point. And, you know, we've had several, several of these cases where, you know, sometimes leadership wants to know who clicked on it because they want to take uh, action against that employee. And so as uh, the attorneys on this call, 
you know, keep in the back of your mind whether or not you've got policies in place or ways to address uh, folks that may click on uh, phishing emails. Another point, um, another another point with this ransomware as a service concept, you know, the dark web or the internet that the, that these threat actors use that uh, hopefully none of us go to has sites that are the equivalent of an eBay for buying and selling backdoor vulnerabilities to U.S. companies. For example, um, in March of this year, just to give you a, a discrete uh, illustration, Microsoft identified a vulnerability in its Microsoft Exchange servers. Now, these are servers that, that, that uh, typically uh, are referred to as on-premises by your IT staff as an on-premises on server for your email environment. Well, there was an, a vulnerability called the hafnium uh, vulnerability, whereby bad guys could gain access to those Microsoft Exchange servers. Um, and not only were, could the bad guys access email accounts uh, where the emails are stored on those servers, worse, it allowed bad guys to install a back door into the company's network. Now, tens of thousands of companies were supposedly hit in March of this year uh, with this vulnerability. Now, Microsoft identified it, offered a patch, and so most sophisticated organizations patched it and prevented it. But for the victims who didn't, nothing happened. And uh, over the uh, several months, the bad guys went dark. Yet this fall, we've had a couple cases already where suddenly a different set of bad guys used the back door from that hafnium attack, and they came in and installed their encryptionware, their ransomware. And so it's believed that the second set of threat actors actually purchased or obtained access to the victim uh, as a result of the, the hafnium uh, issue. So, you know, that highlights a couple things there. You got a patch. Pay attention to your patches, um, but also it, it, it highlights how sophisticated uh, this place is becoming. And so we just kind of want to walk through kind of uh, what it's like to ex go through a ransomware event. You know, so first off, you start with the vulnerability, as John um, showed you. What are some of the common ways they get in? And then, then let's talk about what happens once the bad guys get in. So after they access, have access to your company's network or your systems or email environment, um, we typically see that you know, they come in and they want to move laterally. They want to see what all you have. So they come in, they map out all the devices in, in your network, and they'll look for the hubs in the network first. Um, for, for some of you IT folks like me, uh, they're looking for domain controllers. And then they'll branch out from there. And they just start mapping out, hey, once I get to the hub, what nodes on the network can I see? What's important? And we commonly see that they first go for any backup servers. Uh, so there are, are ways to identify what a backup server looks like on your network, and that's their first target. Then they'll move and they'll look for file share servers. So those are the, the places where, you know, laptops, you know, all your users, all the employees' laptops may point to to actually s the physical place where they're saving the files that are then uh, accessed for business. They'll look for email servers, like a Microsoft Exchange server. And they also target large databases, um, which are, are pretty easy to find. It, you, you, just knowing what, what file types you're looking for and the size of the files. And, and uh, additionally, they will typically look for what types of antivirus or security you have in place, because then they tweak their encryption software uh, around the security you have in place so that they don't trip any alarms um, and so that their activity is latent. And then Depending upon the particular ransomware group that's involved, um, they may also target specific things. So after they've mapped out your network, they know where the keys, where your jewels are, um, they may start running spe specific searches. So you know, certain groups are known to target specifically financial account information, 
They'll look for your company financial accounts. They'll target employees in your finance department. They'll look for employee uh, payment records in HR departments, uh, things of that nature. And then as John mentioned too, um, nowadays, uh, this didn't used to be true just a couple years ago, but nowadays we're seeing that they uh, may actually steal or try to steal data along the way. Uh, we've also had cases where the bad guys have claimed uh, that they've stolen data from, from the, the victim's network, but, but later in the forensic investigation, uh, the, the forensic evidence actually showed they were taking snapshots of the directories so that they could give you legitimate file names and file sizes, but when it came to actually providing like, okay, well, what's in that file? They couldn't tell us that, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and, and so this is all key towards ways to both extort money from you and also um, uh, monetize it quickly. And so um, one of the final steps that they do then after they have moved through your network and potentially stolen the data is they'll, de they'll actually encrypt your files last because they know once they start encrypting the files uh, you're going to know they're there. And um, when they do that, they'll leave a ransom note as well, typically on the affected devices. And we, we've left here an, an example, albeit it's a dated example, um, that will typically come with instructions on how to initiate contact with the threat actor. Sometimes it's over email. Typically we see it's through chat boards on the dark web. There's usually a relatively short window of time provided to contact them, coupled with a consequence if you blow that deadline. For example, here they threaten to double the price of the ransom, uh, but we also see they make other threats uh, as well. Um, the payment is typically demanded via cryptocurrency. Bitcoin is the most popular. I would say that from our experience, you know, this ransom demand I mentioned it was, I know that it's an old one. Uh, because it's only for $400, uh, you will thank your lucky stars if you get a ransom demand for $400. You know, uh, a year ago, ransom demands were probably, you know, five to six figure range. Um, most of our recent cases this year, you're looking at eight figure ransom demands for most, for most businesses in the U.S. Um, the key here, though, is, is the ransom demand um, will force you to act very quickly typically between 48 and 72 hours. And the other thing to note is that every affected device um, may well see the ransom note. In other words, all your employees may be seeing that ransom note in real time as you, as your leadership team is too. Um, and so, you know, then comes the extortion tactics. So at this point of the game, your users can't access their files. Your machines are down. You can't print shipping labels. Your CRM system doesn't work. Your data flows have stopped. Um, and as John mentioned, we've seen several instances where the entire operation of your, your company is reduced to pen and paper. Uh, the other thing that makes it incredibly difficult is the, li the internal lines of communication are significantly impacted. So think about the work from home environment. Um, what if you can't use Microsoft Teams? What if you can't use Zoom? You know, all these different ways to reach people electronically uh, are now, may come to uh, an abrupt halt. And so um, that certainly, certainly ratchets up the leverage and the pressure on you and the executives um, at, at the company. And uh, what we see now more and more is um, the threat actors will also threaten to publish your company's name on their shaming site. Uh, they also typically now claim to have stolen data, whether or not that's true, and threaten to release it on the dark web. And we've also seen in very recent cases where if you don't immediately initiate contact with the threat actors, they'll actually you know, read your employees' emails and they'll start calling the numbers in the emails. They'll start calling your employees. They'll start calling your customers and asking, hey, 
Why aren't you paying the ransom demand? Why aren't you trying to increase your security? We're here to help you increase your security or something of that nature. And so what, what we have here is an actual uh, copy of a home page of the Cuba ransomware group who are very active. Um, <clears throat> you can see here, uh, this is on the dark web by the way, so this is not something that you can www. Uh, you, you need to, to leave your security professionals to access these kinds of sites. Uh, but you can see here that uh, they will typically uh, post some of the data that they steal from companies for free, but they'll also um, sell it. So for example, they may sell troves of data that has social security numbers or financial account numbers to, that would facil facilitate identity theft or fraud. Um, and here you have a, a victim, uh, one of the victims of the Cuba ransomware group from earlier this year, and you'll see um, the, the, the motives here are sophisticated. On the one hand, they're using this as leverage to pressure this company to pay a ransom. And on the other hand, they have a different set of customers or potential customers, and that is other threat actors who may pay them for the data that they, they claim to have stolen. And so here you see the write-up, the explanation of who this company is, the fact that they're a, uh, involved in, in payment processing, and they even go to the, to the granular details to say that, hey, we stole their information on February 4th, 2021. And to give you a general description of what you can anticipate if you pay us for it, um, it, it contains their financial documents, uh, correspondence with bank employees, and you know, other things that, that one could expect that if they purchased the data that they stole, they could use that to commit uh, further financial fraud. Um, so you know, here you can see that um, uh, perhaps the company paid the ransom um, and, and a couple things with that. Uh, so what this kind of tells me without being involved with this particular case is the company likely did not pay the initial ransom before the initial deadline. So the Cuba ransomware group posted them on this site and then the company did eventually pay the ransom to get both the decryption keys uh, to decrypt the encrypted files, but also you can negotiate to have uh, the threat actors delete the data that was stolen. And uh, you know, I mentioned a, a bit earlier that, that commonly when you engage with these threat actors, uh, they do so over chats in the dark web. Here's just a, a sample screenshot that, that we grabbed, uh, but just to kind of show you how it works. Um, so with the negotiations, the ransomware groups do have customer service. It's typically quite good. Uh, and this customer service ranges from anything from uh, negotiating the terms of the ransom and the payment to on the back end, uh, working through the decrypt using their actual decryption software. As John uh, indicated, the, the decryption software itself is not a magic bullet. Uh, sometimes if you have specialized files or systems, it may not always work. And, uh, with that, uh, it's not like you just type in a decryption key and magically you're back to normal. No, no. It's, it's, it's a painful file-by-file -file process. But you can see here, um, everything's negotiable. Um, they, you can negotiate just to obtain the decryption, the decryption key. Um, you can negotiate for them to tell you how they got in. Now, from our experience, when they when they uh, actually tell you how they got in, it's it's something along the lines of, "Well, you have bad security. <laughs> That's how we got in." It would be very vague and generic. Um, and then they, you can also separately negotiate, as I mentioned, to have them delete whatever they took. You know, the big issue, however, is who you're dealing with. You're dealing with criminals. Uh, there are absolutely no guarantees that, that any of this will work. Um, and so, you know, you got to take that into account. And uh, certainly that's one of the things, especially when you're talking about a seven or eight figure uh, ransom amount, um, gets pretty, pretty dicey. 
And another thing that, you know, with the involvement of the nation states, this is just my theory, but, you know, early on it used to be, the, the theory would be, you know, hey, look, these guys, these bad guys went to all this trouble to compromise my systems. They need money. You know, they did it for the money. So if we don't pay them and we just hang out and we wait for them to lower the demand, you know, getting a little bit ought to mean something to them. Well, I'm here to tell you um, that's not always the case. Uh, the bad guys, in our experience now, are demanding eight-figure ransoms. And if you don't pay the eight figures, they say, pound sand, we're moving on, we're posting your data, we don't care about the money, um, which is, is surprising. But that, to me, uh, again, that's just, this is just my opinion, uh, just tells you all you need to know that there's more to it than a gang of thieves just getting paid. I, I think there is nation states behind some of this. Um, so to just give you that, that background and that context, you can uh, hopefully immediately see that there are potential significant legal consequences involved. So we're going to turn to that now um, because, you know, just given today's ransomware techniques, uh, many of these uh, legal issues are quite thorny uh, for ransomware victims. Yeah, just to quickly add to one of the points that Chris made, um, in his particularly the comment about customer service, uh, you know, yes, these are criminals. Um, and we've been asked by clients, you know, how, how can I be sure that if we pay the ransom, we're going to get the decryption code? And clearly a legitimate expense, a, a consideration given that they are who they are. But remember, this is their business model, right? And um, if, if they were to uh, uh, take the money and not give you the, the decryption code or not provide you some level of customer service, as Chris described it, um, that would get out and, and then future uh, victims would have reason not to pay them. So in our experience, if you pay, they, are, they, they typically want to help you through the process because they want the next victim to be incented to pay them as well. So just, just a, another practical consideration there. There, there, there is an honor among thieves. <laughs> uh, so as Chris said, you know, we want to talk a little bit about some of the, the legal considerations that, that flow from uh, a ransomware attack, both, both in terms of preparation preparing uh, uh, before a, a, an attack might occur, but also in terms of responding to attack. We've talked a lot about the practical business considerations, but again, as Chris mentioned, there are, there are legal uh, considerations. And, and we wanted to start with what we consider to be sort of the, the immediate issues, right? Um, one of the first things that you might think to do, you might be recommended to do, is to, to report this matter to law enforcement. Um, and, you know, I will tell you that from a practical perspective, uh, in, in, in my experience, um, reporting this to law enforcement, whichever agency you choose, does not necessarily, A, uh, help you get your business back up and running, uh, and B, uh, help the, the law enforcement agency find the bad guys, because as Chris mentioned, they're typically in some foreign country somewhere, you know, without you know, their identity being known. So it's, it's, it's in, in our experience, unlikely that there's a, um, you know, a, 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 um, a result that is favorable in that regard. Uh, having said that, I do think there are reasons to, in fact, report this. Uh, number one, um, it, it, I, we, are, I, we are seeing that law enforcement is more actively involved in gathering information to help prepare education and, and other, you know, front-end services that, that allow people to um, uh, hopefully avoid a ransomware attack. Um, Chris and I were involved in a matter outside of the United States in which you know, an international police agency was very actively involved in, in the investigation, wanted to know all of the details, and again, seemingly uh, indicated to us that they were putting together information uh, to help educate their local community and other businesses uh, to avoid the same type of attack. And, and, and I think it's genuinely looking to find the bad guys, even though they knew that the bad guys would likely be you know, in China or Russia or somewhere else. Um, so that, that is one reason to do it. I, I think another reason to do it is to the extent that your incident may garner some um, media attention. Um, you know, if, you, if you've received a notice um, about some of your personal information that may have been impacted by 
a cyber incident, it almost always says we are actively working with law enforcement to resolve this matter. Um, there's a comforting, I think, notion to the idea that you're working with law enforcement. And so to the extent that you do have to go public with your incident, um, being able to say that you're working with law enforcement um, is, is, I think, helpful to you. And then the third reason might be, frankly, along those same lines, if there's follow-on litigation, um, I, I think it's another piece of evidence that indicates you took this seriously and you tried to do the right thing. Uh, so if you are going to report, to whom do you report this, this matter? Um, I will tell you that early on in, in my career in doing this, there was a little uncertainty about that. Um, early on, it, it used to be that you wanted to report this to the Secret Service, and, and that was always a little bit you know, surprising and confusing to me. Um, nowadays, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, has kind of, kind of taken the lead because they have now the Internet, Inter Internet Crime Center. So FBI IC3 is, is the federal agency to whom we would typically report uh, a ransomware attack or some other cybersecurity incident because it does involve the, the Internet, and all Internet crimes would be reported through that service. Um, so that, that is, I think, the place to go from a federal perspective. Um, there, there are likely times when you have to report it to a local agency. I mean, again, depending on the circumstances, you may want to report to your local police. What, what if, for example, um, you know, your cybersecurity incident involved nothing more than uh, someone stole a, a laptop from your from your business? I mean, those are the kind of things you'd likely want to report to to the local law enforcement as well. Um, so and, if, and if I could could uh, interject here from just from our experience, John's right. This is an incident by incident kind of decision that hopefully you all as, as counsel are, in, are intimately involved with uh, because each one's different. You know, we've had cases, you know, your loss prevention folks, for example, uh, likely have relationships with local law enforcement and a crime's been committed and we all know from experience that, uh, you know, for example, your insurance carrier may want a copy of the police report, those kinds of things. Um, however, uh, we've also had uh, an instance where as soon as an, an incident happened, the uh, internal employees picked up the phone, called the local police department, filed that police report, uh, again, as soon as this had comes in. And police, police uh, dutifully creates the police report, which is on the World Wide Web and which is actively monitored by a large news organization. And so within hours, the TV cameras were out front of the headquarters asking for comment. And literally the incident just happened, and so you know, you're know you automatically starting uh, back on your heels because you really don't know anything at that point. And so you know, word of caution, you, you need to give thoughtful, um, thoughtful decision as, as to who this is reported to. So, so you, you've decided that you are going to report it. You've decided to which agency you're going to report it. The next question becomes, you know, what information about the incident are you going to share? And you might think, well, you know, it's like any other police report. I'm just going to give them everything that I know. And, and, and I would tell you that there's some thought that needs to go into that um, because you are hopefully going to be dealing with privilege issues. So, so one of the things that, that you, you likely will have done um, and, and we would suggest that this is something you should put at the top of your list. Um, if you, you'd likely talk to your lawyer when this incident happens, probably one of the first calls that you made. And as, as soon as your lawyer becomes involved, he or she is likely going to be talking to you about how you should be communicating and what you should be communicating, and, and of course the nature of any potential privileged communications. And so, uh, and Chris and I debate this all the time because I will tell you, I think the, the law around privilege as it relates to the forensic investigation of a data security incident is kind of changing for the bad as it relates to us lawyers. Uh, more and more cases are finding that these types of forensic investigations are becoming discoverable. And so, again, you, you, you need to consult with your lawyer on this, but what you share with outside uh, sources, third parties, uh, is, 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 is a topic of discussion when it comes to the privilege issue. So, for example, after your lawyer, you're likely going to have called your insurance agent. What are you going to tell your insurance agent? Can you share as much as possible uh, about the incident, or are you simply just going to report the claim? They're going to likely want lots of information, and there may be privileges attached to that communication. 
So, so again, it may be that you can share as much as you need to, but something to think about, something to, to, to consider and discuss with your lawyer. Uh, and to that point, John and I have been in uh, data breach litigation uh, at, at both the state and federal level. Uh, on the one hand, uh, beating back or upholding the privilege over investigation reports. And we've also been on the other side of it, demanding that the, the other side produce their forensic investigation reports. And, you know, from our experience, this all starts at the beginning, at the very beginning, the very first steps you take uh, as to whether or not there's going to be communications or work product uh, that ought to be protected. And it is very tricky such that you really want to contact counsel with experience in this particular area. Early on. Early on. Yeah, and, and what about employees? What are you going to share with your employees? Uh, they're, they're, they're coming to work at work or maybe work remotely, but they can't function. The, the, the operations of the business are completely shut down, and you need to tell them something. We would, we would uh, likely recommend that you not communicate much of anything by way of email. In fact, that's available to you still. Uh, but you need to tell them something, just a question of how much. Same thing with your customers, right? I mean, again, your business isn't operating. What are you going to tell your customers? And then your vendors and your suppliers, uh, there, there are likely contractual provisions that have been implicated by, by this, this complete shutdown of your business operation. And so at some point you're going to need, maybe not as early as, as with your employees and your customers, but you're, the, you're going to need to talk to your vendors and suppliers at some point, and so it's likely that you're going to need to review your contract with them to determine uh, you know, what it is you can and cannot say to them. So now let's talk about whether you should pay or not. And, of course, no one, and I mean no one, wants to pay bad guys. Um, but, frankly, you may not have a choice. Every single ransomware case I've ever worked on, every client has come in and said, well, we've got backups. We've got backups. We should be good. And nearly, not every, but nearly every time, the backups ain't there. They're not, they're not backed up quite like they, they uh, had hoped. And, and so that, that puts you in a spot, right? And so at this point, it's like, okay, well, the business is telling, telling me that uh, we really need this information. It's critical to getting our operations back up and running. Uh, we don't have all the backups that uh, we need, and so let's engage the ransom group. Well, the reality is that the U.S. government has always taken the position that you shouldn't pay these threat actors. They're criminals. Um, and, and now we're seeing that the government is taking affirmative steps to chip away at making it uh, more difficult to actually pay the ransom, you know, even, even if you believe you have to. And so, for example, last fall and again just this past month, the U.S. Department of Treasury issued an advisory from its Office of Foreign Assets Control, or uh, OFAC, as we uh, typically refer to them, uh, to remind U.S. organizations that there can be civil sanctions imposed for paying money to certain persons in connection with ransomware payments. U.S. persons uh, are generally prohibited from engaging in transactions directly or even indirectly with individuals or entities on OFAC's specially designated nationals and blocked persons list, i.e., the terrorist list. Uh, or uh, those folks that are, uh, or I'm sorry, those locations or countries that are covered by um, embargoes. Think Cuba, the Crimea region of Ukraine, Iran, North Korea, Syria. So you know, long and short of it is the um, Department of Treasury maintains a list of people and places uh, where you are prohibited from paying money. And so the uh, OFAC may, in fact, impose civil penalties uh, for violations based on strict liability, meaning that a person is subject to U.S. jurisdiction may be held civilly liable even if it did not know or have reason to know it was engaging the transaction with a person that is prohibited under the sanctions laws uh, administered by OFAC. Uh, as a result, when it comes to paying ransom, that's why, that's why we engage experts who do this for a living and actually know 
how to perform what we refer to as OFAC checks to ensure that a payment can be even made in the first place. Now the catch with that is, I'll tell you, is attribution. Uh, meaning, you know, we, we need to, through our forensic investigation, determine uh, who we believe we're paying. And, and the other part of that is um, the forensic investigators typically um, will not assist you with paying ransom. Some don't do it just as a matter of philosophy, but others will not assist you in paying the ransom unless they've conducted the investigation themselves because they're uncomfortable relying upon others' work product. Uh, and just by the way, as I mentioned last month, uh, Treasury announced that in the event uh, civil penalties are sought, they will take certain mitigating factors into consideration, such as whether your organization had good cybersecurity practices in place to prevent the attack in the first place, or whether your organization cooperated with Treasury or law enforcement. Uh, as John indicated, it's you know, yet another reason to rope in law enforcement early on. Just to be clear, when Chris mentioned a minute ago about working with experts uh, for the clearance and payment of these, these ransoms, uh, he is not talking about lawyers. He's talking about a number of the forensic firms with whom we work in, in, in cyber security incidents. That we retain, and by the way, again, we're talking about privilege, we're talking about work product. Uh, we, we, we typically, the law firm typically retains the forensic, ex, forensic investigator, forensic expert. And a number of those forensic firms have either within their own organization or a relationship with other forensic firms that specialize in the, the clearance that Chris talked about in terms of OFAC and the payment and the, go, the negotiation of the ransom fee. So that's another service that you can retain through your lawyer to have someone actually uh, negotiate, clear, and pay that, that ransom for you. And so there are also, uh, in the potential aftermath, when it's all said and done, um, all types of different tripwires um, that, that your organization may have to address and overcome. So, for example, at, at the federal level, and it really is industry specific, um, but, but a lot of you all are, are going to be subject to the FTC. And, uh, you know, the FTC often acts against companies that it believes have not implemented reasonable measures to detect or prevent unauthorized access to their uh, computer networks. Um, and, you know, they, they use their jurisdiction under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive practices. Um, and, you know, just to highlight, for example, all the way back in 2016, the FTC was singled out uh, a, a company's um, unreasonable failure to patch known vulnerabilities that were then exploited by ransomware. Uh, they, the, the FTC treated that as a violation of Section 5 of the FTC Act. And, you know, here more recently, I think it was just last week I read that um, DOJ is now looking at using the False Claims Act, of all things, uh, to go after any, any government contractor um, that fails to report a data breach uh, to the government or fails to have the data security protections in place that they claim to have had in place in their government contracts. Uh, in other words, if, if your company is making promises, contractual promises, um, at least to the government, you may have False Claims Act exposure, which um, it, it can be quite significant. And, you know, as John mentioned earlier, uh, as to other private parties and vendors and things of that nature, uh, you may also have uh, direct liability for contract, you know, breach of contract claims. Um, at the state level, the New York Department of Financial Services has issued you know, guidelines for companies um, specific to ransomware, and, you know, that guidance kind of sets a lowest common denominator for things like uh, different cybersecurity practices that, uh, you know, they're going to look to see if you have that in place uh, if, in fact, you're the victim of a ransomware. Um, and, 
the, the other part of this too is contingent upon the types of data or information the bad guys had access to or may have in fact stolen. So if there's any type of personally identifiable information, now the state notice of breach laws come into play and you may have to provide identity theft protection services if, for example, social security numbers or particularly for your employees are involved. There are a myriad of different regulation, state regulations that you've got to comply with. Um, and as we've mentioned, you know, you've got potential contractual obligations uh, embedded in the promises you've made in your contracts. And another thing that, that sometimes catches our clients by surprise is you know, the moment this all breaks, the financial institutions, your banks, may actually freeze your accounts. They want to stop the man in the middle schemes uh, and fraudulent ACH transactions. And, and so it will take some time and effort to restore access to your financial accounts as well as to data flows with many of your service providers. So in our last section, section we want to leave you with some action items. Um, and and we, we've broken them down into five different categories, uh, data minimization, best practices, backup programs, training, and, and planning with professionals. So we're going to start with data minimization. And I think it starts with doing a survey of what types of data that you have, right? Because, again, it goes without saying, one way to protect information is to not have it. So, so let's, let's do an investigation of, you know, what types of data do we have? And, and then asking yourself, is this data necessary for a business to function? Um, is, it, is it essential to the business operation or is it just nice to have? Um, obviously, there are different um, constituents throughout the organization that may have input in that. The marketing folks may see it one way, whereas the CFO may see it a different way. But I think it's worth, you know, asking all the, the stakeholders, you know, what types of information do we have and is it necessary? Um, and then, okay, now that we've determined it's necessary, how do, how do we store it? Um, do we have, you know, the necessary um, techn technological procedures in place to protect it? That's something that you may need to confer with your IT department on. Um, or, again, as I mentioned earlier, if it's hard copy, do we have it under lock and key? Um, yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked through various offices and you just see files laying around. Is, is that kind of information, is that the type of information that we should be, um, uh, you know, better protecting? Um, I don't always think it's worth asking who has access to this information and do they really need to have access to this information. I would suggest to you that you should limit user access, particularly to sensitive information, on a need-to-know basis. Um, and, if there, if, if, and if there are uh, databases within the organization that have uh, a limited user set, then again, certain people within the organization have administrative credentials you should limit those credentials as best you can, and then limit who has access to those databases on a, on a technological in a technological way. There are other types of safeguards that you can put in, into place. Uh, again, things that, that are both technological and physical. Those are things that you, you are, that are worth considering, worth talking to your your IT department about, worth talking to your security about. We call it the least privileged model. Again. Who, what information is needed, and who should have access to it. And then finally, um, how long should you be keeping this data? I think it is a very good business practice to spend some time to create a data retention program. Um, yes, it can be cumbersome. It doesn't seem like it's necessary, but I do think it's necessary to help you address these issues. And once you've drafted it, the most important thing is to stick to it. Uh, you should ask yourself, where is your information stored? If it's not stored all in the same location, your information may be stored in a state that has a privacy law that you will need to consider in the event that there is access to or acquisition of that type of information. We, we all have heard about the California Consumer Protection Act uh, and the new CPRA. Uh, Virginia now has a law. Colorado passed a law. Uh, Washington, Ohio are considering laws. Other states are considering laws. There's going to be a myriad of these, these state privacy laws. So again, knowing where your information is and what those laws require is going to be of the utmost importance to you. Uh, if, for example, you know you are the victim of, a, of an attack, cyber attack and a ransomware attack that does in fact ex 
expose personal information, the state in which the individuals impacted by the cyber attack and or the information may require you to give notice to the individuals and or state regulators. So again, well worth the effort to inventory the information that you have and who has access to it. Yeah, and you know, hopefully this data minimization uh, uh, discussion is, is not coming as a surprise. I know our privacy team here at Boris is working through data mapping and data minimization concepts for uh, privacy projects to comply with all these state laws. And so in essence, you are killing two birds with one stone. You're not only complying with the privacy laws, but you're also minimizing the, the organization's exposure. The other, the other regulatory note here is, you know, one of the, uh, an additional thing, of course, is to have a good cybersecurity in place. Now, about half, a little over half the states in the United States require you to, your organization to have reasonable security measures in place over certain types of information. And so we're not saying that you have to have perfect security uh, and spend every nickel, every last nickel, but you at least have to try triage. You need to prioritize where uh, regulated or sensitive information is and have things, for example, like multi-factor authentication in place for anyone who's accessing that uh, sensitive information. Multi-factor authentication is one of the first things that state regulators and federal regulators ask as to whether or not you had that in place when you were attacked. And then you have other things like um, requiring work from home connections to the network to be through uh, virtual private networks. Um, another thing that we constantly see is that organizations do not have a good grip on the number of user or service level accounts uh, in their environment. And the bad actors take you, take uh, take that and use that against you because they're using legitimate accounts that you have no idea that they even existed in the first place. Um, and, and so there's various things that, that you can implement. Uh, one note on the password policies: you, you should make sure that your employees are prohibited from using their personal passwords uh, for business devices, and you should require them to be you know individual accounts, unique passwords, strong passwords of, of at least 12 characters in length and that are reset probably at least quarterly. Um, an additional thing is that, you know, as I mentioned, the bad guys target your backups first. Therefore, think about backups more from a business continuity uh, perspective. In other words, you know, you need to have a certain set of backups for your most critical systems that are offline. You know, I think back to the days of tape backups. Um, but you need to have something that's not connected that um, your, your staff is, is going in at a routine basis and backing it up so it can be stored in a vault or something of that nature. And additionally, you want to make sure your teams are testing the backups to make sure they are backing up what indeed needs to be backed up. If there's one hope that we, for a takeaway today, there's one thing we hope you take away from today, we, we hope it's a, it show your, your thought and, and consideration of training your employees. Uh, and, and I will tell you that, that data security and privacy have to be baked in from the top of the organization down. And so buy-in from all levels of your organization and training at all levels of your organization is of the utmost importance because almost all incidents involving data and data security have the human factor. There, there, in some place along the way, there's been a human factor that impacted the security of the, of the, of the data. So, so please remember to remind and reinforce within all your employees at all levels that they have to carefully review all emails. Uh, a number of organizations now are using the external uh, email label that I've, that I've shown here. Um, if, if, at Boris, if we receive an email from outside of our organization, you see, we see that little blue box up there that tells us it's from outside the organization and gives us a reminder that we have to review who the, the, the from line is, uh, who, who the email address is from. If, if it's from JL and Dolphy at Boris.com, it, it's a little safer than if it's from JL and Dolphy at Gmail at 12345678. So we, we, we want to in, encourage uh, each and every one of you to, to enforce, reinforce that with your employees. Uh, they should only use secure networks, 
you know, setting up shop at a coffee shop, using the, the publicly available Wi-Fi is not a good idea. Chris talked about the, 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 uh, the need for potentially using VPN. Um, things, of, things of that nature can, can uh, bring along uh, really risky uh, conduct. Um, remind everyone to keep their devices up to date. There are often you know, updates that we have to download every, every so often. Those are important. Keeping your, your device locked and safely stored is important. Very good password hygiene, strong, uh, regularly changed passwords are, are, are of the utmost importance. Um, and so again, these are all things that we hope that you'll continue to remind your employees about. Finally, number five, plan with professionals. Uh, we mentioned earlier having you know, a law firm uh, and, and cybersecurity professionals uh, ready and available to help you with these kinds of things is a good idea. It may go beyond that. You may want to consider if you're, if you're a, a large organization but don't have, for example, a PR department, it may be that you want to have a PR consultant that will help you address the public in the event of an incident like this. Um, you may need to have an outside call service to the extent that you have a potential um, credit card breach and you're going to have to contact and provide uh, identity theft protection services to a large group of people um, having an outside call center and an ID theft protection services available to you at the, at the beginning of this incident would probably be a good idea. And then the last and most important part of this is an incident response plan. Having a written incident response plan, I would tell you, is probably your best defense um, because it will just bring some calm to the chaos when something like this happens. So we, we strongly encourage you to have a written plan to include all the necessary players at all levels uh, and to regularly update and test on your plan uh, with a tabletop exercise or something of that nature, at least annually. And so if, if ransomware does happen to your organization, um, just to, you know, the first thing is obviously your IT folks need to isolate the affected systems, and then we need to launch into an investigation. Um, and, and that way we can just determine the scope of what happened or didn't happen and ensure that we have viable backups and that we can then start to um, contain the incident and start remediating it. And you know, as we've mentioned, you, your incident response plan should, should give you a, at least a, a high-level playbook, uh, which should start with legal counsel being involved at the very beginning uh, so that we can make decisions as to whether or not privilege or work product should immediately attach. Uh, that we are involving the appropriate forensic investigation firm uh, and perhaps ransom negotiation firms and or um, a firm to facilitate the actual payment of the cryptocurrency. You know, all those need to be mapped out at the, at the, um, from the jump. Um, and as we mentioned too, we've got to set up some communication protocols. Your incident response plans should already kind of sketch out uh, some thoughts for a starting place because as we mentioned, your employees are likely already going to know. Um, unfortunately, you know. Unfortunately, they may be locked out of their devices and you got to have some backup strategies for how to communicate with them um, in the event that all your systems are down, things of that nature that you know then get into your business continuity procedures. Uh, and then as we've touched on too, notifying the appropriate law enforcement agency and your cyber insurance carrier. All of those things have very tight deadlines associated with them, and, and the last thing you need to do is be wasting time trying to figure out what to do next, because frankly, you don't have that luxury. So that's the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I know we went over just a little bit, uh, but there are no questions in our chat box, so, so we'll end it with that. We hope that you have learned a little something today, and I, I will leave you with the acronym uh, TNT. Uh, make sure that you train and test on all the things that we've talked about today. Thank you again.